is a tough slot, isn't it? Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I'm Deborah Schwartz. I'm the Managing Director for Impact Investments for the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. And I am thrilled to be here with three amazing colleagues from the world of philanthropy uh, to talk with you about the topic of innovation and philanthropy and impact investing. Um, I first want to just do some quick introductions and then we will get right to hearing from the panelists and have a little conversation and we'll leave plenty of time uh, to take Q&A from everybody in the audience. So first I want to introduce Jamie. He's been leading the Lumina Foundation since 2008. Lumina is an independent private foundation in Indianapolis and it's committed to making opportunities for learning beyond high school available to all. Jamie is also the author of a widely acclaimed book, America Needs Talent, and it was named a top 10 business book of 2016 by Booklist, and he proposes bold new ideas for building a pipeline to 21st century jobs. Uh, next to, it's a great book. Next to Jamie is Kelly Ryan, CEO of Encourage, Kelly has led Encourage for 20 years, realizing its vision of a community that works well for all people. In working towards their mission to advance an inclusive and sustainable economy in central Wisconsin, Encourage has developed a, a, an approach that is values-led and user-centered. Kelly is leading Encourage in its commitment to align all forms of capital with organizational values and the foundation's mission. And it's going to be really fun to hear you talk, Kelly, a little bit more about what makes you not your grandfather's philanthropy, as this panel is done. And to my right is Tracy, Tracy Palangian, and she is a trustee of the Serdna Foundation. And she's here today wearing that trustee hat, um, but her day job is as co-founder and CEO of Social Finance. For over a decade, Tracy has worked to reimagine the role of capital markets in enabling social progress. And she um, co-founded Social Finance US in 2011 to develop the pay for success model in the US. Serdna Foundation is a family foundation founded 100 years ago. Its mission is to seek to foster sustainable communities in the United States guided by principles of social justice and distinguished by healthy environments, strong local economies, and thriving cultures. So that is the A-list crew that we have here uh, to talk with you today about foundations and innovation. I'm going to say just a little bit about the MacArthur Foundation, which is where I work, um, and then we'll turn it over uh, to you, Jamie, first. So when I think about what um, makes us innovative at the MacArthur Foundation, and some of you will know about 100 and Change, a big competition uh, that we unveiled earlier this year that will pick one organization to receive $100 million to work on one big problem. And I would say it's safe uh, to consider that a, a hallmark of an innovative uh, philanthropy approach. But in the impact investing realm, where I um, have been, had the opportunity to lead for now 17 years, I think what's made us innovative are, are five things. I'll say them really quickly. One is just that we've been doing it a long time, and that is actually unusual and has given us a lot of experience and a lot of opportunity uh, to try different things. So we've been doing impact investing for 30 years. The second is that we've done it big. We set aside a half a billion dollars for our impact investing. And again, that has allowed us to make bigger investments and engage with bigger players than we might ever otherwise ever have been able to do. I think a critical thing for us is a kind of ruthless commitment to what we call additionality, that we want to do transactions where, but for the foundation's engagement, the transaction, the, the innovation, the scale would not have been possible, additionality. And a, and a close partner to that, and fourth, that additionality is possible 
because we've been privileged to have an extraordinary degree of flexibility, to be more patient, to be more risk-taking, to be lower cost if, that's what it, if that what is what it takes. And then finally, and fifth, I think where we're also unusual is that we've made a real commitment not just to use impact investments to drive the success of our own programs, and that is still paramount for us, for a long time, that was an initiative around affordable housing using impact investments, and now we're rolling out a big initiative in climate. But what also um, we've been able to do in the last few years is to really think about market making, market building, and how to get out of our own program silos to transcend those program-specific interests and do some things where what we're just trying to do is make this marketplace work better, create more on-ramps for more kinds of investors, and solve more problems for more kinds of social entrepreneurs, uh, nonprofits, and, and purpose-driven businesses. So those are sort of our, my quick you know, speed reflection on what's made us different. I want to turn to you, Jamie, and ask, you know, since 2008, how have things changed uh, at Lumina? How have you been thinking about impact investing? Yeah, thanks, Deborah. So, so, you know, a lot of people understandably see private foundations, uh, foundations more broadly as grant-making organizations, organizations that make grants to support social change through nonprofit organizations. And of course, that's an important part of what we do. It's part of our of our social mission. But many private foundations are coming to realize that they're not just good grant-making organizations, they're also very important leadership organizations. That in fact, they've got to contribute to the social progress that they're investing in in new and different ways because society increasingly is calling upon us as private foundations to contribute to that change. Private foundations have a capacity to take risk that many other societal enterprises don't have. Right? So we don't have shareholders who will revolt on us if they don't like our decisions. We don't have voters who will vote us out of office if they don't like the decisions that we make. So our accountability structures are internal, and therefore our responsibility to take risk to actually improve social progress is very important. And we take that responsibility seriously at Lumina Foundation because we're a very mission-driven organization. We're one of the largest private foundations in the country, but our mission is focused very specifically on increasing high quality post high school attainment, uh, educational attainment. Our interest is in dramatically increasing the number of Americans who have high quality degrees, certificates, certifications, and other credentials that might be developed in colleges and universities or through workforce based programs or through direct to consumer contacts. And in order to be able to get there, we've got to use all of the tools in our toolbox in order to be able to achieve our objectives. So grants are certainly one way to do that. We also are a large-scale convener. We're an organization that's uh, highly invested in public policy. But uh, beginning actually in 2010, we began uh, investing much more seriously in the space of impact investing, first by actually investing in, and in one case, creating a fund, a venture fund, uh, with fund managers that are focused on edu education-oriented investing. So we've committed um, a, a portion of our endowment to mission-related investments through fund managers. We've committed uh, about $30 million of our portfolio to date to mission-related funds. Uh, and uh, those funds are, are a very important part of what we've done from a mission perspective. But in the last few years, we've come to realize that um, impact can also be achieved in other ways. And one of the ways that we've started to do that in the last couple of years is through direct investment uh, in a portfolio of companies that we are investing in. So we're heavily engaged in um, early stage and seed investing in companies that we think can actually contribute at scale to our goal of dramatically increasing high quality post-secondary educational attainment. Um, it's a fairly unusual thing, I think we would all agree, for private foundations to do, in part because uh, foundations have a legal hurdle they have to get over when they invest in, in individual companies. We have to actually have to demonstrate legally that our primary interest in the investment is not to make money. If we make money that's incidental to our interest in the social uh, benefit that you're getting, that's fine, but we actually have to demonstrate that it's not our primary interest. And uh, in the last few years, we've built a portfolio that is now seven companies. We're on a trajectory to add two to four companies per year to our investment portfolio. But our objective really is to invest in companies that we think 
can produce 10 and 20x outcomes compared to the grant investments we might make uh, through our other strategies. And, and our, our interest is a, a far and wide. In other words, we've invested in companies that are not only dealing with traditional learners, but people that you might call college students today, but also people who have no prior experience in the post-secondary learning system. One company we're investing in, for example, called Care Academy, is training home health care aides and getting them on the pathway to their first credential so that uh, in this one of the fastest growing uh, areas of work in the country, um, home health care aides, uh, we can actually help those individuals who are primarily low income and first generation populations get on the pathway to long term success. So, so our approach to impact investing is that it's added a tool to our toolbox at Lumina mm -hmm. Foundation in a way that we think can achieve large scale impact and be consistent with our mission. I'm going to turn to Tracy in just a second, but I, I'm just curious, could you say a little bit about your board of directors and kind of where they fit in on this journey that you just described as you've become, you know, further, got, gotten further out there on the risk spectrum and really... Yeah. Yeah, you know, our, our board of directors is, is a diverse board. You know, we're, we're a dozen people. I'm a voting member of the board. And uh, our interests are aligned. We, we come from different professional and ideological perspectives, but our interests are aligned in dramatically increasing this high quality post high school attainment. And uh, the board came to realize early out that with an endowment in excess of a billion dollars, with capital that we can deploy in, in many different ways, that we should take that risk that I was talking about to achieve the, the, the greater outcomes. And so our board has been heavily engaged in supporting and encouraging us to do this. Um, there's an old joke in philanthropy that if you've seen one foundation, you've seen one foundation. There, there, there are really no two foundations that are alike. And in our case, uh, my board actually does not vote on grants, so it therefore does not vote on the impact investments either. Mm -hmm. The board is uh, there to set policy and frankly to hold us to a very high standard of accountability when it comes to our, our outcomes. We're very metrics driven as an organization and they are watching the impact investments very closely to look not only at the financial returns, but also on the social returns. And, and those social returns, which is increasing the credentials that are awarded, focusing heavily on equity because uh, racial and ethnic uh, equity are very important components of our work, ensuring that uh, we are actually contributing to system-wide change uh, in post-secondary learning. That's a key element of what the board is doing, but, but um, they are, uh, they recognize that this work is happening in real time and they are not engaged in the actual uh, approval of the deals, which has given uh, me and, and my colleagues, led by uh, John Duong, who leads Lumina Impact mm -hmm. Ventures, uh, the flexibility to actually get a lot done quickly. And it's definitely an innovation. Yeah. <laughs> so, Tracy, tell us a little bit with um, CERDNA, which is 100 years old, which is really extraordinary. What uh, what really prompted the foundation to take on the impact investing journey? And it's been quite a journey, so tell us a little bit about what's unfolded. Yeah, so as Jamie said, if you've seen one foundation, you've seen one foundation, and the Cerdner journey was dramatically different uh, to that of Lumina. So for context, um, as Deborah mentioned, we are a 100-year-old, um, still family-governed foundation, and there are three non-family members on the board, um, and I'm one of them. Um, and uh, the endowment is a little bit over a billion dollars. And um, as Deborah mentioned, we work on sustainable environment, uh, strong local economies, which is basically, you know, good jobs, fair jobs, um, and arts and culture. And around two years ago, the board wanted to wrestle with whether or not to get into impact investing. And because CERDNA is such a high touch both on the grant making side as well as on just general kind of decision making, very much a learning organization, decided to um, form a working group, which I chaired, to explore um, the, the possibilities. We went into the journey with no preconceived notions that we would do anything, and, um, and I was very careful given my day job was very much you know, a public advocate of impact investing, but was re we were really there to understand the possibilities the various strategies across different asset classes, um, from the public markets to the private markets, fund investing, direct investments, um, all the tools that Jamie mentioned, uh, as well as really doing an audit 
of the existing endowment to see, you know, what do we own today? Know what you own. That journey took around nine months, and we emerged from that journey with um, just a greater sense of clarity around what we wanted to do, and the ultimate decision was that we would um, have a $100 million impact investing allocation, um, broadly focused on everything from a program-related investment which might seek below market returns, all the way to something that would generate alpha. Um, but something in service of these values and our programmatic areas, broadly defined. We also decided to adopt a couple of strategies which would affect the entire endowment, so the, 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 the 900 million plus. Um, and those two strategies include, um, and, and I'll have a, you know, asterisk after this if folks wanted to hear more about it, uh, to be an active shareholder of um, the securities that we own through through our managers. So, you know, in, you know, implicit in that is that we decided not to screen out negatively or divest from from any um, industries, uh, as well as um, just being very intentional. Every single time we look at a new manager, ask ourselves the question: uh, All things being equal, are we looking at all the women and minority-owned managers out out in the marketplace to fill that asset class? So uh, it's been an amazing journey. At the end of it, we hired the amazing Shweb Siddiqui, who is, I think, in the room to, to lead that work. Uh, we also organizationally <laughs> decided to have one investment committee uh, to overlook both the, uh, you know, quote unquote, traditional endowment as well as the impact strategy. So um, it's a work in progress. We just got started and uh, really excited for the journey ahead. Thank you, Tracy. Can you just double back for one second? One of the things you mentioned is that you decided not to do negative screening. And I kind of want to call that out because you wouldn't think of that as an innovation. Um, because in fact, for most foundations, or for many, the path starts with negative screening, positive screening, impact investment. And yet you're saying that was something you really decided some would know it by the term divestment. Can you say a little more about why you reached that decision? Yeah, I think it's very natural as human beings when the whole impetus of this journey was actually to align your values with your endowment and with all the tools in the toolbox. So the instinct is to get out of stuff that is not aligned with your values. But then as you peel back the onion, it's actually not that straightforward. Um, and, and, and what we tried really hard is to remove all those implicit biases, you know, just speaking of behavioral economics, and I'm so excited that Richard Thaler won the Nobel this week, <laughs> that, um, you know, what problem are you trying to solve and what is the lever to try to solve that problem? And by the way, um, you know, if one were to think about, you know, divestment to, you know, the, the theory of change would be that you would affect um, uh, uh, the cost of capital for a company because you would either be buying more of it or selling it down. So unless it kind of reaches you know, a, a certain tipping point, that theory is actually um, uh, you know, really difficult to play out. And I think there was a lot of resonance among the board that we would rather be, you know, as the Hamilton Mills musical would say, be in the room, be at the table to change the conversation, to influence company behavior, and um, you know, not to borrow a Cold War analogy, like be, use a strategy of engagement rather than withdrawal mm -hmm. to, to amplify your voice and, and to, um, to make change that way. So we decided not to do it. And, and another quick point, Deborah, is that it's not s simple to just divest. Like what exactly are you divesting from, right? Um, say guns, is it, you know, rifles, military systems, is it handguns, um, and is it uh, just the manufacturers, is it distribution as well? Like it, the, the ripple effects keep going out. Um, also, we, we do most of our investing through managers. So, um, you know, that would also mean pulling out from a lot of great managers that have delivered great return to us over the years. So um, at the end of the day, we decided to be active shareholders, mm -hmm. use our voice, and uh, revisit this question. It's not a done deal. We can revisit it in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's where we uh, end it. Thank you. So Kelly, your foundation is kind of the new kid on the block, right? A little bit, 25 years, not quite. Um, uh, very deeply, deeply rooted in a place. Um, 
And I, I think it would be really uh, fantastic to hear, first, what is it that is driving you as this deeply place-based foundation? What is driving you to innovate? Mm -hmm. And also, if you have any observations about community foundations more generally, that you, things that you think distinguish you from community foundations, love to hear that. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, deeply embedded in place. Um, and Encourage is located in central Wisconsin uh, in the Midwest. We serve a fairly small area, about 45,000 people. And what motivates and drives us to innovate really pr was prompted and born out of crisis. Um, and that crisis would be that we were at one time the smallest city in the U.S. to be home to a Fortune 500 company whose headquarters was located in our region until 2000. And the headquarters uh, of this paper company sold and moved to Finland, and within three years we lost 40% of our total employment. Um, and that same paper industry or paper company had been in the region as the primary employer for over 100 years. So not only did we lose the, the jobs, um, what was left behind was an embedded culture of dependency on a single industry, of um, of insularity, of aversion to risk, um, and, and we were a fairly traditional community foundation at the time, money in and money out. And it was clear to us, really, that, um, that us remaining as a traditional model, money in, money out, was not going to transform that community, and that, in fact, we had to transform ourselves and rethink what, what was it that was going to help this community. It was going to be about a lot more than money. And the other experience I would say that um, uh, influenced our drive or my personal drive to innovate was spending time just about a year after that uh, with the support of the Ford Foundation in Northern Ireland to see how other organizations mm -hmm. that weren't so focused on money, on finance, um, uh, the frame over there was in fact money was not going to solve deep-seated conflict. Um, that it was going to be social capital, it was going to be focusing on human potential, on love, relationships, and forgiveness, right, mm -hmm. in, 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 in Northern Ireland. And for us, that gave context to what we could do uh, in central Wisconsin. And so our focus uh, for 17 years since the sale of that company has been on a community and an economy that works well for all people. So at the time, we had no idea what that meant. And we knew that that's what we wanted, uh, we being encouraged. Um, but we also felt that uh, creating the cultural shift needed, we needed the people that lived in our community to have a sense of agency, of ownership, and control over their future, which was not what was embedded in that place. Um, so we embarked on a process of articulating values, what was important to us and to the people in the community. Uh, we talk about holding the community and each other in trust, um, and we have a platform around which we um, think of ourselves as more than a community foundation, really a community steward, a steward of all resources and capitals. Um, we committed to 100% alignment of all capitals, um, and that was about four years ago. We are not at 100%, like you heard Clara perhaps this morning talk about at Heron. Um, but we are committed to it, and we're on the journey to achieving 100% deployment of all capital. So we think about human resources, we think about our financial resources, natural resources, etc. cetera. Um, and one example of that, so it's just one example um, that uh, I think is taking a traditional tool uh, and customizing it to have local impact in place, was born out of the sale of that paper company. So the paper company sold for a value of $4.8 billion. You know, think about that in that small community, $4.8 billion. Uh, sold to a company in Finland. Um, from that sale then, about two years later, it was sold to a private equity firm in the US, another um, paper company. And within two years after that, that private equity firm declared bankruptcy but during that time period really stripped natural resources from the community, further reductions in jobs, uh, left bankruptcy uh, and debt in the community, including actually debt to us for retraining paper workers. Um, and then just two years ago, that uh, next sale was to another 
private equity, uh, Verso Paper Corporation, actually owned by Apollo Venture Capital, so another private equity. And within 12 months of that sale, they declared bankruptcy after they had taken a large amount of capital out of the company. So there was this pattern of extraction. Um, and when we were working with our uh, investment advisors, so we have a traditional advisor in Colonial Consulting, like them very much and have been working with them for a long time, Impact Advisors in Avivar, and then we also started working with Aperio, um, here mm -hmm. in California and Chicago, in starting to think about how could we have a voice on behalf of the community in terms of what happens there, right? So that pattern of corporate disinvestment. So we took direct ownership positions in not only every paper company in the region, but we also thought about what other publicly traded firms are actually employing our people in that, in that area of central Wisconsin, as in like a Walmart, as an example. So Walmart is the number three employer in the state of Wisconsin. We took direct positions and then felt perhaps we could do more and we could create our own uh, public equities fund that was focused on Wisconsin. And so that's what we've done. Uh, we spent the last, this is just very, very recent, we spent the last 18 months working diligently uh, to construct uh, a Wisconsin shared stewardship equities fund. And um, it's really interesting that a lot of the data took a lot of time and research to find. Uh, we employed MIT Sloan School students, our CFO. Um, it would have been easy for us to go to Bloomberg and just take um, corporations that had headquarters in Wisconsin, but that was not what we wanted to do. We wanted to weight that portfolio based on which companies had headquarters in our region, and then beyond that, which corporations actually employed Wisconsinites, uh, and then who else did we need in certain sectors like clean tech to balance out that, that fund, this passive index. It's benchmarked against the Russell 3000. Um, and we have screens on it, and screens that are important to us uh, around labor and workforce practices, governance practices, and sustainability. And our foundation is not a billion dollars, we're $30 million, um, and we just funded that um, uh, Shared Stewardship Equities Fund last week was $6 million, so um, we're very, very proud of that. And we're going to practice active ownership, even happier about that, right? So that the community has a voice the next time a public equity firm decides to sell a corporation in our community. Um, and the other side, and then I'll stop, the other side of that is not just agitating for bad practice, but also supporting good practices in business and corporations, and I called Walmart out earlier. Um, and you talk about frontline workers and lower income, but in communities of our size, Walmart employs a good number of people. Um, we do a lot of work and have for the last decade in workforce investment, workforce strategies, and have watched Walmart make investments and improvements around job quality and how they're thinking about training frontline workers. So when they raise their base rate, uh, we support that as a shareholder because it's good for our community. And when they're training frontline workers in terms of essential skills, it helps the rest of our community, our manufacturers and others, because it's a pipeline of, of, of talent, if you will, in workforce. That's great. Thank you so much, Kelly. That's an extraordinary uh, story and shows a lot of just tenacity and creativity and, and how you've approached uh, this work. Jamie, I wonder if we could go back to you for a second for an, maybe another example. And Kelly, thank you for, for sharing some things that have really you know, made concrete the, the kind of innovation that you're bringing to bear. You mentioned um, some of the investing that you're doing at Lumina is aimed at getting really big multiples in terms of outcomes, right. that, that you're not doing them necessarily to make a fortune for the foundation, but really the, the driver is the idea that you could get bigger impact yeah. um, than otherwise. Is there a company that you would have invested in that you think has that kind of promise? Yeah, you know, it, it's worth underscoring the point that you're making though here, which is that, and, and I think we've been through this, the, the journey, the, the evolution of our thinking here, which is, so you know, I've been at the foundation 10 years, and when I got to the foundation, I would say, what kind of impact are we having with the work? And people would say, well, we're making grants of 50 to $70 million per year. And I'd say, no, 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 what kind of impact are we having with in the work? And so there's this mentality that I think um, was largely present for in, in philanthropy, which has clearly evolved in that decade, that what you spend is what your outcomes are. And to me, that never made any sense. The point is, what kind of social impact are you having? 
And so this idea of being tool agnostic, of saying, well, it could be a grant, it could be a mission-related investment, it could be a program-related investment, that's the important thing to think through here. And as we've approached our direct investment strategy, and we've got working with Avivar Capital as well to, to source and, and uh, do dil due diligence on these deals, um, we've had several objectives in mind. One is that we're trying to support entrepreneurs of color, a uh, very important element of our work. So our, our, our portfolio of seven companies, which is growing very dramatically, we're, we're on the pathway to the, to the 100 million that, that Serdna uh, is on. Uh, five of the seven entrepreneurs are people of color. And I was talking to a large investor uh, a few months ago uh, who's got over 100 companies in their portfolio, and they said they don't have five in their portfolio of over 100. So we've made that a, a priority. And some of these uh, companies, uh, I think, are really um, pressing the idea that you can actually achieve large-scale impact by actually transforming the learning system. So I mentioned Care Academy earlier as an example of training home health care aides. We've got an investment in a company called Edovo, which is uh, essentially providing uh, education to incarcerated populations using technology in order to dramatically scale the impact uh, that you could have. And we're even uh, working with a company called Credly, which is essentially a, a digital uh, platform, uh, a, a provider that's actually uh, verifying uh, digital badges and other kinds of digital mm -hmm. credentials to dramatically scale the number of people who um, have and can demonstrate that, that they can do something with these digital credentials. So the idea is to swing for the fences in terms of impact, mm -hmm. to be less concerned about what the tool is, whether it's a grant or something else, but actually focus on what is the impact. Are we going to dramatically increase credentials? Are we going to uh, uh, bend the curve on equity? Are we going to increase prosperity in American society through talent? Those are the things that we're really focused That's on. really exciting. Has the, as you've ramped up or kind of intensified the impact investing practice, has it had any effects on the grant making practice? Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I keep saying we're agnostic about the tool. And it's literally true that the, the grant makers and, uh, and uh, John, who leads the, the impact investing team, are really sort of seamless. Uh, and in fact, I was just talking uh, earlier today with uh, one of my colleagues. We have a presentation for our board next month. And we're going to talk about our investments in incarcerated populations. And it was very easy to say, oh, we're going to talk about this grantee here. And we're going to talk about Edovo. And we're going to talk about that partner over there that's doing a more contract-oriented work. It was all seamless. It was all, it was not, what are the grants? What are the impact investments? What are the other things? It was, what are we doing to increase uh, educational attainment for incarcerated mm -hmm. populations? Because that's what we need to move the needle on, on American talent. And uh, you know, I think that the uh, intersection of, of the two, the fact that uh, they are working together in a very seamless way, is very important. Because what should matter ultimately is not where you sit, but what impact um, uh, you're having. And uh, to me, you know, to go back to the Hamilton reference, you know, we can't throw away our shot here. We've got one shot to actually use a large investment portfolio, you know, a large endowment to build an investment portfolio of impact investees and grantees, et cetera, to move the needle on our mission-oriented goals. And we're going to try to use all those tools in our toolbox to actually get there. That's, it's really remarkable because I think for a lot of foundations, um, there's a very different culture around grant making, different mindset, different educational background and experience, work experience. So that seamlessness that you say you've been able to achieve, I think is, is quite remarkable. I'm just curious, Tracy, as you're watching things roll out, um, as you said, Schweb is a phenomenal leader for CERDNA, and congratulations uh, for bringing him on board. Um, how's that going, and, and do you anticipate that same kind of seamless quality? Yeah, we, we've, we've seen it. It's happening, um, and, and that is one of the greatest byproducts, and also an intentional um, strategy of ours to bring the two sides of the shop much more closely together. Um, and I would also underscore, and we have much to learn from you, Jamie, just being so clear-eyed about outcomes and having your mission as your North Star and actually, you know, measuring outcomes and knowing the impact of your grant making strategy or your impact investing strategy is actually no easy task. Um, and, and we're trying to apply that same outcomes focus and impact focus mm -hmm. um, 
to, to, to the work that we do through both the grant making and the impact investing. And I would also expand the holistic um, dimension uh, beyond that of the investment staff and, and the grant making staff in the sense that we've also brought the um, investment committee together. We've seen foundations where you might have, you know, a subcommittee dealing with impact investing and then a more traditional investment mm -hmm. committee. We actually is one, we're one and the same, it's the same group of people. Um, and we're also using the same uh, investment advisor in Cambridge Associates that oversees the entire thing. Mm. So um, again, um, uh, it, it'll take time to kind of have everything sink in, but it's, it's been, you know, Schweppes been off to a great start. And are there particular program areas that you think out of Cerdna's portfolio that are going to be more likely to lend themselves to impact investment elements than others? Yeah, clearly the sustainable environment, mm -hmm. uh, you know, grant making strategy has just a lot of exciting, both program related investment opportunities and, and mission related investment opportunities. And a recent one, and I have to write down this acronym because this is so long, which we're really excited about, it doesn't sound so exciting, mm -hmm. but it's a new energy capital infrastructure credit fund. Apparently, um, kind of small to mid-sized renewable infrastructure project, mm -hmm. Um, they have a harder time accessing debt financing. Mm -hmm. So this vehicle is actually focused on that sized participant in the marketplace and providing capital to renewable energy and solar power projects. So, um, you know, we, we think we can get market rate return out of this fund. And um, so we're excited about this and many others that we're putting to work. Great, thank you. Kelly, can we switch back to you for a second? Um, Something that is used as a, a phrase to describe how your foundation works is user-centered. Do I have that right? I wondered if you could say a little bit about what user-centered philanthropy or user-centered mm -hmm. impact investing, yeah. what, what is that? Sure. Um, so with the commitment to people at the center of, of place, right, that um, if we think about pipeline of opportunity for capital, as an example. Um, pipeline in a place or community begins and ends with people. And people that live in that community really need to have a sense of agency, ownership, and control. And in order for us to foster that, we had to be very authentic in asking for participation, not just for voice, but for authentic ownership. So um, we actually do have five principles around how we operate with user-centered, and it applies to our grant-making practice, how we prioritize our investment portfolio. Um, but in practice, when we work in the community, we talk about um, sharing power uh, with community, with residents, prioritizing relationships between and among individuals and institutions, um, including all points of view in, in the process. Uh, using all kinds of knowledge, so thinking about traditional measurement, but also non-traditional sources of native wisdom, of intuition, etc. And then testing solutions early and often. So that idea of not too dissimilar from human-centered design and some of what we hear them talking about with the Good Capital Project, but in our, in our case, it really begins and ends with people that call a place home. Is that... So is there an example of either an impact investment activity or a grant activity that you think would kind of um, Sure, so two. Um, one is uh, 2012, we did a very broad community outreach, community survey we called it, but it was really boots on the ground also, and an extensive canvassing about what was important to the people that lived in our community, what were the priorities. Um, from those priorities, uh, we did two things. Uh, one was we looked at uh, what kind of CDFI investments were we going to make in the community uh, mm -hmm. to advance um, the four priorities that the residents came up with, and we aligned our CDFI investments accordingly. Um, and then the other was um, uh, we bought a building. Uh, we bought a building in the middle of our downtown, so small community, uh, Wisconsin River running through the center of it. And that river really is beautiful, and it had only been used predominantly to make paper for a very long time. And what we wanted to do, uh, because one of the priorities that residents said was a greater sense of ownership around our place, we bought the, it was a vacant Gannett newspaper building, bought it and turned over the decision making to the community and said, 
what is it that you want in this place? Um, and really spent two years with a firm out of New Orleans, Concordia. Um, their commitment after Hurricane Katrina was working in parishes with residents to have residents identify what kind of housing did they need to be rebuilt in those parishes, not what the federal government decided needed to be built. Um, and they worked with us and our residents to say, what is it that you want in this building? And to their credit, our residents said, we feel like we need something that's gonna grow business, it's gonna grow entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and seed innovation and creativity in a community in which all of our children were raised for the most part to be paper workers, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's not yet realized. We're raising capital for it. Um, and it will house a microbrewery uh, mm. that will apprentice home brewers. It'll be the first apprenticeship program in Wisconsin for uh, home brewers. It will also have uh, makerspace, entrepreneurship training, and uh, local food uh, in the form of a culinary test kitchen and a local cafe. Thank you. Yeah. Does this concept of user-centered investing in philanthropy, does that have any resonance for you? Could you think of ways that it applies to either of your institutions? I can talk about it with my social finance hat on, which um, is, um, you know, the, the pay for success projects that we build really start with the person, um, the vulnerable um, populations, and uh, everything flows out from there. So, um, you know, as we build this type of impact investment instrument, starting whether it's, you know, a person recently released from prison, what exactly this person needs, not just in terms of the intervention, but actually the operational handoffs when he leaves and walks out of the gates, what needs to happen to enable this person to transition into a program, because there's a lot of leakage between someone actually being released from prison and actually signing up to a program, all the way to making sure that this person is supported all the way through the, um, you know, the new trajectory is uh, something that, you know, um, we found to be very important in designing the right projects for, for pay for success. It's the outcomes, it's the use of centrality, and obviously um, the, the uh, cost benefit analysis to go with them. Yeah, there's an interesting element of, of the back to the, you know, if you've seen one foundation, you've seen one foundation. But many of us that are working on system change um, have tended to be focused on investing in institutions that are going to contribute to the, to the system change. And uh, mm -hmm. while that's good, over time, what you uh, convince yourself of is the fact that the institutions are the most important things that you should mm -hmm. be investing in. And you forget that it's the users, it's the people. In our case, it's the learners and the workers that are trying to make that transition from learning uh, to work that are the most important thing. So our unit of analysis is people. We're not investing in individuals. We're investing in organizations and strategies that will help us get that 10 and 20x uh, scale. But unless you have a user-centered strategy, what you're mm -hmm. going to ultimately convince yourself of is the fact that if the institutions are good, the people are good. And that may not be the case. In higher education, for example, we have what would, some people would argue is still a robust higher education sector. We still have the largest or close to the largest system of higher education in the world. But the output of that system is not sufficient to meet our talent needs as a country. So we've spent so much time thinking about how do we create more colleges and universities? How do we build the system of higher education to do more? We stop thinking about whether they're serving the right people and whether they're serving enough of those people in the right way. In other words, giving them the knowledge, skills, and abilities, the talent that they need to be successful in work and in life. So unless you have a user-centered model, unless you think about the individuals that you're impacting, mm -hmm. um, you can convince yourself that the sector is doing fine because mm -hmm. the institutions, the providers are doing fine. And that's clearly not the case. And if you think about our impact invest investments and the investees, the investees are crystal clear that Lumina's investment is about moving the needle for individuals, creating change so that we do get more of those people through the, through the uh, prison to work pipeline, so that we get more of those people into those uh, jobs that will move them from post home health care aides to other uh, opportunities in the healthcare sector. That's the key for us. It's making sure that the users, the individuals, are the focus of the work. So I want to build from that. It's really, really interesting to hear how this concept, which, you know, Kelly, your foundation has um, 
put into such deep practice, and, but in a very specific way and place, but that has resonance across other kinds of institutions. Um, something else that I wanted to just touch on before we maybe ask you for some prog prognostication about the future, and no more Hamilton, you'll have to come up with, <laughs> or Richard Thaler, you'll have to come up with something else. Um, let's talk a little bit about how you capture impact. Um, Jamie, let's start with you because um, you, you think about it a lot. You really, you, uh, it sounds like your foundation really uh, considers it a, a great priority, in fact, to be metric driven in how you approach the work. Um, how have you come to your current system of measuring or capturing impact? And is it a, a really major investment that you've had to make? So our, our unit of analysis, as, as I said, is individuals. And to articulate our, our goals in a simple way, um, we have a time-limited quantitative goal for our work. We think that 60% of Americans should have a high-quality degree certificate or other credential by 2025. So literally, all of our efforts are aimed as a national foundation in trying to be a catalyst for the country to get to that goal. So our basic unit of analysis is, do more people, do a higher proportion of Americans have high-quality post-secondary credentials uh, than they did last year? And the good news is, since we started this work in 2008, we've gone from a little under 38% of Americans to a little over 45% of Americans who have achieved that threshold. So we have made made progress, and hopefully Lumina has been one of the catalysts that's helped to, to get us there. But our metrics for our grant work are the same exact metrics as our metrics for our impact investing work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the important thing to understand, is that the impact investments, just like the grants, have to demonstrate that they are going to lead to more credentials, that they are going to make equity a priority, that they are going to focus on high quality credentials, not just, you know, sort of a production of credentials that have no labor market value, don't contribute to our, our, our uh, democratic system or, or, or in other ways. So, uh, and uh, we have this measurement system that um, is entirely transparent. So our metrics are fully transparent. You can go and look at our website right now and find something called a Stronger Nation. And our Stronger Nation metrics uh, used to be an annual report, but now we up update them as data becomes available. And you can disaggregate by state, by county, uh, by race and ethnicity and a lot of other factors so that you can understand how the country is doing on the core metric of increasing attainment. But I, you know, I think that um, absent the use of metrics and being clear, having this time-limited quantitative goal, uh, you can end up in a position where your, where your um, outcomes are really just directional. Mm -hmm. More and better are good. Mm -hmm. How much more and how much better? That, I think, is demonstrating that you're exercising your leadership potential as a foundation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do either of you want to comment on your perspectives on this issue? Such an important dimension of both just philanthropy in general, but impact investing, and how you capture impact in a way that's useful to you as a, as a foundation leader? I think, um, broadly, we need to expand the definition of what impact is, right? And, and what kind of returns we're looking for uh, that are non-financial as well. So um, we're very transparent in terms of outcomes, and we do capture traditional outcome measures. But when we're thinking about um, deploying all capitals, how do we measure social capital? How do we measure human capital, et cetera? Um, and we've been working uh, with a cultural anthropologist. Uh, we use an evaluation frame from Boston, an evaluation frame for the last six years looking at networks. So mm -hmm. networks of relationships between and among individuals and institutions. Um, and how do they contribute to what we call the enabling conditions for change to happen, mm -hmm. right? Because when we're talking about working in culture and relationships between and among human beings, it's one thing to measure the financial capital investment. It's another to understand the conditions of readiness in place in that community. Are people actually working together? Are there levels of trust? Those things are difficult to measure. Mm, they're easier to notice and document and tell mm -hmm. stories about. But in terms of traditional outcomes, I would tell you that's what we're wrestling with right now um, for two years with support from the Knight Foundation. Another front of innovation. Yeah. Tracy, how, is that? How, how would Serdna think about, uh, if you were to look ahead 10 years from now, if your shareholder engagement, this activist 
approach to ownership that you've described, if that's successful, what will that change look like or how will you know? It's an excellent question. I actually had a, a quick exchange with Schweb on what we hope to see 10 years from now. I think we hope to have um, many experiences on the shareholder advocacy front so that we can refine um, what we bring to the table for each of these conversations. Uh, we hope to have uh, demonstrated some change behavior. Uh, but more broadly, um, we hope that um, we can begin to demonstrate on the journey that uh, impact investing and taking non-financial factors into account and really thinking about impact across the investment portfolio is the new normal, is smart investing, is the mainstream way of doing things. And, um, and that is our hope. And in that um, forward-looking spirit, I just would love to get some final thoughts from either you, Kelly, or Jamie, or both, as to looking ahead, you know, either do you have a view of what you think philanthropy needs to keep doing to innovate and to be relevant, and in particular, on yeah. the impact investing front. Yeah, I think I, I do. And I think that, well, in our case, in 10 years, hopefully we'll have gotten to the 60% goal. So that, that's uh, since our goal is, is 2025. But, but I think more broadly in philanthropy, um, I think there's a few things that I, I hope we will have achieved uh, in the coming decade. One is that we'll continue to innovate in the tools that we're using to help us achieve these social outcomes. So Tracy's, a, you know, in my view, the leading expert on paper performance tools like social innovation bonds. And uh, we're doing feasibility studies right now in our own space around social innovation bonds, which uh, there's been very little deal flow in our space uh, there. So that's an example of where you gotta continue to expand the tools that you're, that you're developing to, to achieve impact. But you also have to, I think, um, invest in expanding the network of the people doing the work, the entrepreneurs. And uh, we've worked with partners like Camelback Ventures and Village Capital and others to both um, expand the pool and the diversity of the pool of entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. We've supported an innovation prize. So we're trying to grow the sector and then fund the growth of that sector through our impact investments so that we can create a more dynamic ecosystem that can actually contribute uh, to what we're trying to, to do as one foundation. And as a private foundation, uh, part of a, a broader sort of network of philanthropic organizations, I think it's going to be very important for us to learn from each other about these different models. I do think that that joke about philanthropy is an asset in one way, which is that we have the opportunity to learn from each other in each of our unique ways to actually enhance the success of our individual efforts in, um, in service to the greater good, in service to the idea that philanthropy can imp increase uh, social and economic prosperity. Thank you. Kelly, do you have any? I do. I have thoughts? two yeah. points. I just um, I think are important, and one is um, relevant to what Clara Miller said this morning in terms of foundations needing to be the change, um, and to be the change uh, requires inner work and introspection on the foundation itself, on foundations culture, on the structure, um, and one of the speakers last night talked about an incessant examination of privilege. And mm -hmm. I think that that's what we need to do as institutions is really have a, 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 a persistent examination of the privilege that we have and how, are, how is it being deployed uh, to advance mission. The, la the other thing I would say is um, uh, the idea of pipeline in communities beginning and ending with human beings um, and the need to uh, steward moral capital of communities. Um, and I need Jamie and others to build uh, impact infrastructure. I would say you need me and others like me to hold the moral capital of community and foster moderation, civility, and compromise. Mm -hmm. Not just in communities, I think we need more entities like that as a nation. But it costs money to tend moral capital. and philanthropy and foundations, I think we need to see uh, and do, better, do a better job of funding those that are tending the moral capital of place because that's, we need each other. Thank you. 
I just I hope that all of you, uh, like me, have been just wowed by this, the story of these three organizations. And you can see that innovation in philanthropy is taking shape in all kinds of ways and all, diff all different fronts. Um, but I think for sure you are all bound together by being extraordinarily thoughtful and intentional, um, by being brave and taking on things that in, in thinking in your own way, and above all, being free to think differently and to think and put names to things and talk about moral capital and so forth, and to really push the envelope and to push all of us uh, to think harder about what we're doing. So. With that, um, we're gonna close our session. I wanted to let you know that uh, Mission Investors Exchange, which guest curated today's panel, has a few more sessions that'll be uh, cl before closing out the day. Uh, one of them will feature a, a, a collaborative that I'm very proud of uh, called Benefit Chicago, uh, which we launched a year and a half ago in collaboration with our community foundation and the Calvert Foundation. So I hope you'll think about staying around for that. Um, and there'll be um, another uh, forum that will describe the steps of a simple deal, so something practical and how to. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. 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 Thank you.